Well, good morning, everyone. Sorry, we're a little short staffed, so I was playing tech support in the back there. Uh, so it took me a little while to get up front, but welcome back to our time together of worship this morning as a church family. Glad to see folks here and uh, as well as folks online that are joining us. I know that it still may be a little while before we have uh, more folks filtering back in as uh, different people feel comfortable with the, the various uh, restrictions, recommendations that are in place, as well as just kind of their own personal health. So we're going to try and do our best to stay connected as a church family in this time uh, through you know, personal calls, emails, visits, cards, as well as what we do uh, here on Sunday morning. Is there any announcements that you have to share uh, with the church family this morning? Okay, uh, I did want to mention normally the first Sunday of the month is communion, but we're not going to be celebrating communion this month um, as, a, as a group like this, just uh, out of an abundance of caution. Um, and hopefully we can get back to that in July, if not July, then in August. We'll eventually get back to celebrating communion um, together. And uh, also remember, uh, as State Road 11 is closed, as I found out this morning. I announced it to you guys last week, and I still came the same direction as usual. And then I was like, oh, no. And so Anya, she, her sweet spirit, she perked up. She's like, well, we get more time together, Daddy. And so we had a chance to you know, take the detour and just spend a little more time talking and visiting with each other on our way here. Well, let me uh, pray, ask the Lord's blessing on our time together, and then we'll enter into some time of uh, musical worship together. Lord God, thank you for my church family. Thank you that we get to gather together and be a family. We get to worship uh, you and we get to rejoice together in who you are, what you have done, and in the family that you have given us. Lord, I pray that this morning that as we uh, sing, that you would engage our hearts, that we would intentionally engage our hearts and minds, but that you would meet us in that time that is is not just words that are sung or, or melodies that are hummed but lord that it is um, worship that is truly given to you and as we get into the scriptures i pray you would open your word to us as well that we would not uh, leave this morning the same as we came in in jesus name amen good morning everybody is doing well this morning we've got another beautiful sunday morning out there uh, kind of been a warm week. It's kind of gotten summertime here on us, but uh, this morning is a little more refreshing than what we've had. So let us uh, stand this morning if you want to, and uh, we will begin our worship in some few songs that we all should know pretty well. Kind of taking most of them out of the old hymnal this morning. So let's we'll start with Down at the Cross.
Amen. Father, we come this morning, and we do lift up in prayer in the name of Jesus. And what a friend, what a great friend we have in the name of Jesus. One that went to the cross. One that shed his blood. One that died for our sins. Father, we're so thankful to come together this morning to worship, to give praise in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and to worship our Lord and Savior. And all these things we pray in his name this morning, Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated, and uh, Adam's coming back up. And we do thank Adam for helping us this morning with singing with the uh, playing his harmonica. And we'll try to have a little more of that in the future. Yeah, I'm not necessarily qualified to play on all the songs, but some of those things were awfully fun to join in. It's uh, good to be a part of that again. Let me get my microphone adjusted here. There we go. Hopefully I don't tug the camera off the tripod. Uh, well, this is our time of being able to pray together as a church family before we uh, enter into the Word together. Uh, I had a couple of reports. One is that my dad, who has uh, been suffering with kidney stones, he was able to actually get a surgery and get that uh, removed, and he is totally fine now. So he's, I mean, there's a little bit of recovery still to go, but he is not in pain anymore for the first time in 12 days, and so he's <laughs> very glad for that. Also, um, a neighbor of ours that our kids are friends with, and Amanda and I are friends with them as well, um, uh, the mother and grandmother, uh, her name is Karen, she has uh, stage 4 pancreatic cancer, and so it doesn't look like she has real long. So we definitely want to pray for Karen and for the rest of the family. She's definitely a believer, uh, so we can take uh, great joy and comfort in that, but uh, she's kind of having a rough, rough time right now. Are there other praise reports or prayer requests you have to share with the church family this morning? All right. Well, let's, let's go to the Lord together, please. Father God, we rejoice that we are here together in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all names, the one who has purchased our freedom. You have given us everything that we need for life and for godliness through your power that dwells within us. Thank you. Father, we want to lift up to you our family members here who are uh, having a, a hard time right now. We pray for Mary that you would... Um, free up her throat that she could swallow just a very normal activity but could do so without pain. I also pray for Bev that this infection in her leg and the healing that needs to happen after the surgery with her knee that you would heal her quickly. But I also pray that you would stabilize her dad too as he's had this uh, pneumonia and just numerous other health complications right now. So we pray for Dale for his strength for his restoration. Um, we also lift up to you Tim as he is we rejoice that he's able to be home, but yet he's still not better. And Father, I pray that his good days would outnumber his bad days, that he would continue to grow in strength, that you would provide for them what is needed for him to be able to remain at home and not have to go back into the hospital. And I pray too that as uh, Pam returns to work, that she could do so in peace, knowing that he is well cared for. Thanks that my dad is doing better, um, that, that he's not dealing with the kidney stone anymore. It doesn't seem to be any further complications. And we also pray for Karen, too, our, our neighbor's mom, as she is what seems to be in the home stretch. And I pray that her, her final days would be uh, serving, continuing to serve as a strong light for you, as she has been. And Lord, that you would use this for the salvation of others, uh, especially within her family during this time. Give them comfort as they say goodbye. Lord, this morning, uh, I'm excited to share with my church family what you have shared with me this week. And I pray, Father, that it would be impacting to us, um, that we would um, realize the, the strength and the power that we have when you call us. The, when you say that we have a job to do, that we can do it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, as I alluded to with our country being in somewhat of an upheaval uh, right now, it's uh, a time when you turn on the news and you're seeing pictures of you know, riots and marches and protests and all that. Uh, there was one here in town, which if you get the paper, uh, you're aware of that, it happened downtown. And I was actually able to go and participate in that. It was interesting because uh, I was invited by another pastor, a pastor I really respect, and said that he was actually going to be a part of this. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go downtown, but not really knowing what to expect when I showed up. Um, and so I, I show up and they're like, well, the march is over there and you have to wear a, a mask. You know, everybody there is supposed to be wearing a mask, but the march is over there and here, you know, you can get a sign. I'm like, I didn't show up to like march or anything. I just showed up to kind of see what's going on and, 
you know, I do believe that all lives matter, and black lives matter, and white lives matter, unborn lives matter, all, you know, all life matters. And so I was there for that purpose. And it was very interesting to be a part of what was a very peaceful rally, but you could tell some people had some, some anger and some energy as they were a part of that. But I have to tell you too, when you see what you see on TV, realize that um, the people who are standing there are not all standing there for the same reasons. And when you are in the middle of something like some things that I could clap for, and I'm hearing some people clapping for some things that I couldn't clap for. You know, there were some people that were promoting agendas that I agreed with. And there were some other people that were promoting some agendas that I didn't agree with. I can't agree with as a Christian. Um, and so, yes, all life matters, but there's other people there that believe that lives matter, but they also had some other things that they were passionate about that they were shouting out for or carrying signs for. I'm like, I can't really embrace that. You know, And so it's very interesting when we get into the midst of a situation like that to realize the, the unrest that, that can come. And I'm really glad that what happened here was peaceful. The mayor was a part of it. The sheriff was a part of it. Um, and so I rejoice that, that people could get out and to, to share their voices and even disagreeing voices sometimes, but do so in a peaceful manner. But that peace does not always reign in a society. It does a lot when there is strong leadership. Not always, but, but often. And what we're going to see today, and you can begin turning in your Bibles to the book of Judges, um, we're going to see a time when there was not a lot of peace in Israel. Uh, that's the reason that I felt led to the book of Judges today uh, for, for this morning, because like, where can we go in the scriptures at a time when our nation is in a lot of turmoil, when there's a lot of unrest and even uh, a lack of the rule of law at times? And that's a lot of what this is described for us in the book of Judges. Now, the verses are not going to be on the screen, basically because I operate on a Mac, and we have a PC here, and it looked great on my Mac, but when I put it on here, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is all goofed up. And so I'm like, I'm not going to confuse you guys with what that looked like on the screen. So open your Bibles, grab one from the pew in front of you. We'll be in Judges chapter 6. Now, I've got to give you a little background on the book of Judges. Um, Israel had had really strong leadership when they came out of Egypt. That was uh, under Moses, okay? So Exodus through Deuteronomy is under Moses. And then it was transitioned to strong leadership under Joshua as he led them in for the conquest of the promised land. And God had said, you know, you need to uh, wipe out the inhabitants of this land or drive them out and so that their worship of other gods does not pollute you, because it will. If you leave them here, it's going to pollute that, the purity of your worship to me. So now if you jumped past the book of Judges and Ruth and then you get into Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, this is under the leadership of kings in Israel. So also there was strong leadership. And so though there was unrest, there was some stability. But in between the leadership of Moses and Joshua and the leadership of the kings of Israel was this very lawless time called Judges. Now, when we think of judges, we think of the person in the black robe with the gavel up there making decisions in an orderly courtroom got to get that image out of our heads because that is not at all what is talked about in the book of Judges. A judge, as it's referred to here, is a person that would rise up or God would raise up to deliver Israel in a time of difficulty. A person who was more like a, a warlord or a chieftain often. Okay, that's what we're thinking of. A person who's swinging a sword, not swinging a gavel. All right. And uh, when we think of this, we have to understand that the people of Israel did exactly what God had said in the fact that they turned away from him and worshiped other gods because they did not drive out all the other inhabitants of the land. You can read about that in the first couple chapters of the book of Judges. It's very detailed with lots of geographic names and, and names of tribes and peoples, but basically understand this. When they came in, they drove out some of the inhabitants, but not all of them. And so their idols remained, their idolatry remained, and Israel's heart was pulled towards that, and they began to worship these other gods. And whenever they did, God would say, okay, I'm removing my hand of protection from you. And when I take my hand of protection away, you're going to see that chaos is going to ensue. There's going to be war or you know, battles within yourselves. There's going to be invading armies from outside. There's going to be disasters that are going to happen because my hand of protection is taken away from you because you have strayed away from me. Does that sound familiar to our nation right now? That we've turned farther and farther away from God. And so more and more natural disasters, foreign interference, political unrest, all these things that are happening because we have strayed away from God. Now in the book of Judges, we see that God raises up a leader and they, they rout the foreign enemy, they send them out, and then there's a time of peace as long as that judge is alive. But as soon as that judge dies, the people turn back to idolatry again. And then the foreigners come in, they invade, 
They oppress the people, and the cycle just repeats over and over again throughout the book of Judges. Today we are going to look at a context where there was a foreign um, occupying force that came in, and these are called the Midianites. Okay? Just think a lot of people riding camels come in and they just take over and it says they're like locusts on the ground. There's so many of them. They come in and they, they decimate uh, Israel's agriculture. They, they destroy the crops. They take the livestock. And so Israel's not left with any food. It's a very, very critical crisis time for them. And in the midst of this, God sends a prophet and says, here's the reason it's happened. Because you are not following the Lord the way that you are supposed to. You've turned to follow other idols. That's why this is happening. But then God points out somebody, not points out, chooses, and comes to somebody and says, I'm choosing you to deliver Israel. And that's what we're going to look at today. It's this guy that when we find him, he's not swinging a sword, he's swinging a sledge. Okay, something that's used for threshing wheat. He's not up on a hilltop rallying the troops. He's down in a hole in the ground hiding. But this is the guy that God chooses, and his name is Gideon. So let's go to Judges chapter 6, and we're going to start reading in uh, verse, I think, believe it's verse 11 here, where we're going to be. Uh, 12, excuse me. Now let me turn to Judges. That will work a lot better than Joshua. There we go. Um, Judges chapter 6, verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now, a lot of times I read through a whole passage and we go back and unpack it. This time we're going to take it piece by piece. So here we see Gideon threshing the, the wheat inside of a wine press. Now, a wine press is kind of like a pit, all right? Normally threshing was done up high, like more on a hilltop, where the wind could blow the chaff away. But because of the fact that on the hilltop he'd be visible to all those Midianites, he's down in a hole in the ground. He's threshing out the wheat. So he's hiding out of fear, and God comes to him and says, Greetings, mighty warrior. Does he look like a mighty warrior to you? No. And he didn't look like a mighty warrior to himself either. So here we see that, uh, that Gideon has a calling. God says, Greetings, mighty warrior, and he is confused. He is confused by this calling. I don't understand. I'm not, I don't seem like a mighty warrior. Why, why would you call me a mighty warrior? But the principle that I want us to get out of this, and there's going to be about four or five principles we're going to get this morning. This is the truth that you need to hang on to, is you are who God says you are. It doesn't matter if you're hiding in a hole in the ground when he comes to you. If he calls you a mighty warrior, you're a mighty warrior. God calls people often as something that they are not. You remember Abraham? Okay, his name was Abram, and God changed it to Abraham. Abraham means father of many, but he didn't have any kids at that time when he had that name. God called him what he would become. When God called a, uh, a shepherd boy from the flocks, he's the youngest one in the family, and God calls him and anoints him to be king over an entire country. He, will, he didn't actually get to take that ahead of time. Peter, in the New Testament, his name was not originally Peter. That's what we think of him as, but his name was Simon. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Peter. And then he says that on this rock I will build my church. Not talking about Peter so much as it was Peter's confession. Peter was a very crumbly rock, if you remember. He denied Jesus three times. But Jesus called him Peter, called him rock. Hey, Rocky, all right? You are are going to be one who is going to be a leader of my people. God called him before he was, and here you're a mighty warrior. Gideon wasn't a mighty warrior at that point, but God had called him, so that's what he was. And God was going to make him into that, and God is going to do the same for us. If he calls you something, that's what you are, regardless of whether you feel like it or not. Now, I want you to see his confusion, though, that comes now in verse 13. Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if, if Yahweh, the Lord, is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all of his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. So if I can kind of simplify that. If God's with us, why are we suffering? Why the pain? Why the problem? Now, ours is not usually because of an occupying enemy. But if you think about it, some of us have other things that are occupying our lives. We have disease. 
and sickness, some bad diagnosis that, that we have. We've got strife. You know, we look around our country. Why all this unrest? If the Lord is with us, why are we suffering all of these things? Why? This was his question. The question was why. And the angel answers him, but he doesn't answer that question. Instead of answering the why question, God answers a different one. Actually, three different questions all in one statement. Look at verse 14. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? What does he answer? He answers not the why question. He answers the who question. You want to know why, Gideon? You. I'm not answering why. I'm saying who. You. And what do you have to do? He answers the what question. Go deliver from the hand of Midian. And before Gideon can even ask how, God answers that question too. In the strength that you have, you go and you will be able to do this. Now, this leads Gideon to something else. And this is a look in the mirror. And this is his confession. Look in verse 15. He said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. When I look in the mirror, I'm not seeing a deliverer. When I look at my family tree, I'm not seeing anything mighty here. I'm not seeing any resources that I can bring to the table here, Lord. How is it that I'm going to do what I'm going to do, what you're telling me I should do? And in verse 16, God makes a commitment to him. The Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. So what's God's commitment? It's twofold. God's presence. I will be with you. You might not have any other resource, but if you have God, you've got all you need. Gideon, I'm going to be with you. You don't have to worry about it. I got this. And then he also makes a promise. You will deliver. I will be with you and you will deliver. Because I am with you, you can. And this is the second um, truth. Well, actually, this is the second and third truth that we need to see. One is that you have a job to do for God and that he's going to give you everything you need in order to do it. If he calls, he provides. God's um, mission will always have God's supply if done in God's way. I, that's a quote from somebody else, and I kind of butchered it a little bit, but that's the truth there. If God calls you, God's going to supply. Just got to do it God's way. And we're going to see in uh, next week or two that God has a very unique way of carrying out this calling. But before we go any further, what I want, you to, um, what I want us to do is let's kind of look at ourselves a little bit here. Each of us has a calling on our life. Each of us has something that we're supposed to do for the Lord. Now, most of us are not called to defeat of an invading army. Some of us are called to serve in quiet ways. Some of us are called to serve in, in very public ways. Some of us are called to labor at something long-term, just plodding along over a very long period of time. Others of us are called to step out into something very scary, kind of a point-in-time thing like what Gideon's being called to do here. What has God called you to do? Let's take a look at these, these first couple truths here. One, do you know who you are? God has told you who you are. Not necessarily looking at your resume, not looking at your history, not even looking at your present abilities. Do you know who you are because of who he says that you are? I would encourage you to have a list that you keep in your Bible or a notebook or something, a piece of paper, maybe one of the blank pages in your Bible where you keep a list and it's titled with two words, I am, and then dot, dot, dot. And underneath that, bullet pointed out everything that you see in the scripture about who God says that you are. Who does he say you are? And if you want a good place to start, go to the book of Ephesians. The first two, three chapters there are chock full of statements about who you are. You go there and read, you're going to find out you're a child of God. You are a citizen of heaven, that you are adopted. And you can just say, I am adopted. I am a citizen of heaven. Down the line. Keep that list and you're going to be able to refer back to that because there are times when you may forget because of all the circumstances around you who it is that you really are. I've had some times when I've been extremely discouraged and I forget that I am a child of the king. You know, it's not that I necessarily cognitively forget it, but very practically I forget it. Why am I walking around with my head down like this and all depressed when I realize I'm a child of the king. I've got all that I need. He's promised to provide for me. 
There will be times when your identity will get battered by your experiences. Go back to the truth of God's word and who he says that you are. Realize also that he has a job for you to do. If you're breathing, you've got a job to do. And also realize, too, that God will give you everything that you need. It doesn't mean that you got it right now. It doesn't mean that you're going to have it tomorrow. But when you step into that situation, he will supply all that you need to accomplish. And he's there with you. Now, in response to all this stuff, Gideon has some questions. And he's got one question primarily. Now, most of us have not had an angelic visitor. Okay, where an angel just shows up and talks to us. Here it kind of says the angel of the Lord, and sometimes it says the Lord said to him. It seems this is like a, a pre-incarnate form of Jesus, but it's God like talking to him. And so I got to say, if, if somebody showed up, if I saw a person in front of me, even if this person was really grand, I think I would be like doing a double take. Is this really God talking to me? And, and he's got the same question. Look at verse 17. Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please don't depart from here until I come back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I will remain until you return. Now, the next couple of verses talk a little bit specifically about the offering and then what he does with it when he gets there. But he, he places the offering out. And then look at verse 21. The angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand, touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Now this here served as confirmation for him. Oh my goodness, this was really God who was talking to me. We need sometimes a sign of certainty that we have heard from the Lord. This was Gideon's sign, and we're going to find out later. He asked for some other signs as well. But God gives us a sign that it is God that was talking to us. That sign of certainty comes through worship. Here it is that we see. He doesn't just say, give me a sign. He says, give me a sign. Now let me go and prepare an offering to bring back. An offering was a, was a form of worship. If you want to know that it is God speaking to you, directing you, the best place to go is into worship. God, I'm going to worship you regardless. And I'm going to let you confirm to me in whatever way you will. Worship is the place to go when we need confirmation. Now, this next thing, though, is Gideon's response to what the angel just did. Okay, that, that fire that leapt up and consumed it. And I call this the, the consternation. All these letters start with a C just because I'm a pastor and that's what we do. Okay, but he, he's like freaking out. All right, he, there's this amazement. Verse 22, when Gideon saw that, he was, that this was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Can I interpret that? I'm a dead man. I just, I just encounter God, oh my, this is terrible. Kind of like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, when he saw the Lord, he's like, woe is me, I'm a sinner, I've just seen the Lord. That should be our response. There should be a response of fear when we encounter God. Now, that fear can, is, is not always like, I'm going to die, but there should be some sort of reverence and awe in this realization that this is not a God that I approach flippantly. Every time we come to the Lord, we have to realize this is the God of the universe. This is the God who created everything. This is the God who can give life and take life. We have to be respectful of that. But look what God says to him in verse 23. The Lord said to him, peace to you and do not fear. You shall not die. And this is that word of comfort. That word of comfort that comes to him. And then what does he do in verse 24? He worships again. Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it the Lord is peace. And to this day, it is still an Ophrah of the Abiezrites. When he was faced with this question, is this really God speaking to me? What did he start with and what did he end with? Worship. An offering. And then he built an altar, a, 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 a way of memorializing this encounter that he had with the Lord. Oh my, I'm going to worship because I've just been in the presence of God. When God calls us, the place to start and the place to end is always with worship. With worship. Now, one of the things that is important to do whenever we're looking at the scriptures, we need to spend time looking for Jesus on every page. Every page of the scripture, every, every 
text, every passage, every, um, uh, every book of the Bible points toward Jesus. And there is a gospel connection that happens here in this encounter that he has with the angel of the Lord. The first thing is um, that when we realize who God is, okay, when he realized, oh, this is the angel of the Lord, it should invoke fear in us. God, this is who you are. When we encounter God now, when the gospel is preached, there should be a woe is me moment in there that we realize I am a sinner. The gospel is good news, but it's because the gospel has bad news associated with it too. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. If we don't get to that point, the good news will not be as good as it should be. The good news of heaven isn't just the fact that we get to dwell with God for all of eternity, but that we avoid the penalty of hell that we all deserve. There should be a woe is me moment in there. Um, Also, that just like what happened to Gideon here, that when God speaks to us, this is truly good news. It is a word of peace to us. He, God said, basically, peace to you, you're not going to die. And in Ephesians um, chapter 2, verses like 14 and 17, it talks about how Jesus is our peace between us and the God who we have offended with our sin. God has sent a peacemaker for us. He has spoken a word of peace, and that word is Jesus Christ that he has sent for us. But then also, also the, and any encounter with God always needs to end with worship, just like it did for Gideon. Now, when we look at Gideon, I'm hoping that you see a reflection of yourself there. Some of us are in the pit right now. You know what? We're down there because of the fact that we are fearful of something. I'm fearful of what I'm facing. There's a danger that is there. I am in a low spot right now. God meets us in our low spot, and he calls us forth. He calls you by name. He gives you a calling, a mighty warrior, a prince of the kingdom, a princess of the kingdom. I have a mission for you. I've got a purpose for you. I've got an identity for you. And it's not what you're experiencing right now. It is so much more. God calls us out from that. And he gives us a mission to do for him. We need to respond in worship. And if we have any question, God, is this really you? The best thing to do is to draw close to him because the more time you spend with him, the better you will understand him and the more you will recognize him when he shows up. I've shared this kind of illustration before, but in in our house, um, if I'm not in a room, I can still tell who is in the room. Okay, if I'm in the basement, which is where my office is at home, I can tell sometimes who it is that's coming down the stairs or who it is that's walking upstairs because each person in our family has a different, uh, different step, a different gait, a different weight to how they walk. Okay, there, there could be the, the little shuffling, there could be the, the quiet steps, There could be boom, 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 okay? I know which child that is that's going through the house, right? The more time you spend with God, the more that you will be able to identify his footsteps. You will be able to identify him even when you don't necessarily hear his voice. You'll say, you know what? I can see that God is in this moment. God is in this encounter because you've spent time with him. Spent time with him in the word, Spend time with him in worship. Spend time with him in prayer. So let's close this service by spending some time in worship of God, getting to know him a little bit better. As we do, I will be down front. If anybody has a prayer need, you're welcome to slip down there beside me. But take this as a time of interacting with your heavenly father and saying, God, is there anything in the story of Gideon that I need to recognize, that I need to incorporate And even if there's not, just spend time worshiping, getting to know him better and giving back to him what he deserves.
Michelle for worshiping uh, with us today. And I'm hoping that as we go forth this week, that we do so with a greater understanding of who God is, the calling he has on our lives, and who we are because we are his. Go forth and make it a great day in the Lord together.